coming week. And even evaluations, nitpicking about all the, the transitions that are taking place and appointments that are being made by President-elect Trump. And you probably thought, well, Sunday morning church is going to be a safe place for me to go to get away from it all. And Pastor Strong's talking politics again. <laughs> well, there's a reason this morning. Do you remember uh, Donald Trump's slogan from his campaign? Perhaps you remember seeing it plastered on billboards or on the little signs in the, the yards around your neighborhood or even emblazed across the front of baseball caps. That slogan was this. Make America great again. It's a very simple message, isn't it? And it communicates it well, that there's something wrong with America, it's not great, and if you elect me, if you elect Trump, he will be the one to bring the change to fix it and make it great again. Now we could debate all afternoon, all the rest of the day, about the greatness and the state of America right now and what it would be to look great again and whether the next president can do that, but that's not my point. My point this morning is to take a look at this statement that there's something wrong and someone's coming to change it and to fix it. Because isn't that the whole point of Isaiah chapter 35 today? We see in it that there's something wrong, but God comes to make it great again. You see, throughout this chapter of, of 35 of Isaiah, we see this just drastic and quite amazing change that takes place from one thing to another. And it all comes about because of what God promises. And really the highlight verse of this whole section, verse 4, where God says this, Your God will come. He will come to save you. As we draw just another day closer to celebrating Christmas, we are reminded again this morning why it is that we celebrate a child born in Bethlehem. Jesus came. He comes to make life great again for us by changing our hearts and guiding us on a path to heaven. Now for a moment this morning, I'd like for you to transport yourself from out of this, this cold, wintry, wet morning and, and put yourself in the desert. Right, put yourself in the dry, barren wilderness in a place that is just crying out and longing for water where nothing can grow because it's just too dry, too hot. The, the climate is, is just not good for sustaining life. Are you there with me now? This describes the spiritual state of the people of Israel at the time of the prophet Isaiah. God's chosen people, the nation that he chose out of all the peoples, all the nations, his special possession, rebelled against God. They were unfaithful to him. Their eyes and their ears were closed, closed to his message that he carefully placed before them. And they were cruel and unloving to one another. They were spiritually dead. And now God had sent the prophet Isaiah with the difficult and challenging but yet important duty to tell the message of the, to the people of Israel that because of their sin, God was going to punish them. God was going to allow another nation to come in and to carry them off. The Babylonians were going to come, destroy their land, take the people captive, and at the end, destroy the holy city of Jerusalem. The whole book of Isaiah up to this point, the first 34 chapters, are this message for the most part about how God was going to bring judgment and condemnation upon his people of Israel because of their sin and, and, and to the surrounding nations. And in fact, just before our chapter starts today, Isaiah wrote this, The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon all their ar armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. You see, the spiritual state of Israel, their souls, and also the future of their land and their people as a nation, it all looked bleak, like a dried up, barren wilderness where there was no life. Life was not great this time in Israel's history. And instead of, uh, instead of there being joy and gladness, they were filled with despair and defeat. 
And yet today we stand about 26 to 2700 years removed from this time. And yet the same issues that the people of Israel wrestled with are still relevant today. Because the truth is, you still wrestle with being right and faithful with God. You chase after the things of this world. We still rebel against God's commands. I know that you have a rebellious streak in you. And often you close your eyes and ears to what God says and even His message of love and forgiveness. And there are times where you are uncertain about your future and about your life, your relationship with God, and the love of others in your life. And and at times we are attacked and even carried away by the things of this world and by our own weak, sinful natures. And you may be tempted at times to wonder if God has forgotten about you, whether he's forsaken you. And you live in fear. Fear of your sin, fear of your guilt, fear of your weaknesses, fear of God's punishment, fear of the world. And it leaves you defeated and distressed. But while God describes the empty, dead, spiritual state of his people in the same spiritual state that we can have, in Isaiah chapter 35, he describes something new. He describes how he changes that all. And how out of that dry, barren desert would sprout up and bloom plants and trees, that it would be as fruitful and as plentiful as as places around Israel that were famous for their rich forests like Lebanon and Carmel and, and Sharon. Crocuses and plants and beautiful flowers would sprout and grow in the wilderness, a drastic change from what you would expect. Rivers and waters would, would, would flood the plains to give life and to support life in that desert area. And God used a picture of a weak and feeble body, hands that are weak, legs that shake. A person who is lame and unable to walk, whose eyes are blind and ears are deaf and whose mouth cannot speak, would be changed to have strength and security and firmness. And would eyes that would be open and lips that would shout the praises of God and, and legs that would leap in praise. Why? Why could something as dead as a desert bloom to life and as someone as weak and as as fearful and feeble as we can be, be strengthened and find confidence? It's because our God comes. And He comes to make life great again. He comes in His compassion as He promised to the people of Israel to restore them and to give them that life. And He gives that promise to them and to us today. Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Death Valley is a desert valley located in the eastern part of the state of California. And if you've ever been to that that region, it is just a dry, barren desert landscape. And it is the hottest and driest, one of the hottest and driest locations in all the world, has the lowest elevation in all of North America, And you don't see a whole lot of life there. That is until you go in the spring, and and then you'll see some wildflowers start to sprout and grow. But they don't last long. But once in a while, there's a really rare occasion that takes place in 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 Death Valley. And it only happens when the conditions are perfect, just right. But when the conditions are perfect, like they were this last March in 2016, and Then again in 2005, when those conditions are perfect, this dry, barren landscape all of a sudden becomes a sea of gold and yellow and white and pink flowers. This super bloom of spring wildflowers only happens when the conditions are perfect, when there's just the right amount of rain in the winter and spring, when the temperature is just right, and when the spring winds that usually tear across that barren valley disappear and are gone. And it's when those conditions are perfect that all of a sudden life blooms in abundance in this once dead and barren desert. The conditions have to be just perfect in order to bring life into your spiritually dry and dead souls. But that's what God came to do. Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come He will come to save you. 
It's this message of good news, the gospel message that God held out before His people of Israel as a reminder that He would come and He would restore them. And the same message He gives to His people of all time, He will come to save us. And here we see God's perfect love that at just the right time, God came and took on flesh and lived among us. He came as our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus lived a perfect life in a perfect relationship with God, with perfect obedience. And then Jesus gave up that perfect life on the cross as the perfect price to pay for the condemnation and judgment for our sins that we deserve. And then as we hear that gospel message, conditions are perfect for God the Holy Spirit to enter into your heart, to bring great change and transformation into your heart and life. So that in a place of, of our hearts and our lives where sin and death destroy all things, instead through faith in Christ, life springs up. The life that you have because your Savior has won it for you. Life in which sin is washed away by the flood of God's forgiveness. Life where you are right with God and have a perfect relationship with Him. Where life where, where within you blooms love for God and love for your neighbor. Life in which your eyes and ears are open to see the love of God on the pages of Scripture and in your own life. Life where Christ comes to give you hope and confidence and purpose. Jesus has come to give you life and salvation, to make life great again. That we can have that joy and gladness no matter what takes place around us and whatever God allows in our lives, we know that our Savior has come to give us salvation. And that Savior comes to not just give us salvation to change our hearts and lives, but He comes now to guide us on our way to heaven. Isaiah describes for us a special highway. And the name of this highway is the way of holiness. Now in order to really understand the highway that Isaiah describes here, it's important for us to picture what the roads and highways in Isaiah's time looked like. They quite honestly were nothing more than really paths. Paths that were often crooked and filled with rocks and potholes and things that would cause you to stumble and fall. They were not easy to traverse. And on these roadways, it was often dangerous to travel along them because there were wild animals that could attack along with those who were trying to, to hurt or to harm you, robbers and thieves. And yet Isaiah describes for here a different kind of highway. A highway that is smooth and flat. A highway that is well-traveled and is straight. A highway in which the dangers of, of attackers and everyone else are removed. A highway that leads to God's holy city of Zion. A highway in which the people that travel it are full of gladness and joy. That's the highway that Christ comes to have you travel with Him along. Through faith in Him. Now you and I know probably and are much more familiar with the, uh, the roads of Isaiah's time. Those crooked roads that are filled with potholes and things that cause us to stumble. And not just because we live in Milwaukee but because we know the temptations that are in our lives that we stumble over and the things that sometimes cause us to crash and burn in our relationship with God. And there are those who would try to attack us and to pull us away from our, our path with God and, and try to get us to go along the old crooked paths that lead away from Jesus. But Christ comes. And He shows us the salvation we have. And He shows us the new life that is ours. And through faith, He guides us along that path to know His love, and to live in that love. But it wasn't cheap to build that highway. Us in Wisconsin, we know how expensive it can be to build highways. In fact, in the news this last week, I heard lots about how our politicians in Madison are arguing or debating or whatever you want to call it about how we're going to fund all the expensive road construction and repairs of roads and new highways that need to be built. It's not cheap. And in fact, something like the Zoo Interchange started off with a price tag of $1.7 billion. And I don't even want to know what it costs now today. But know that this highway of holiness cost even more than that. It was a highway built 
with the very holy, precious blood of Christ our Savior, worth very much more than all the gold and silver in all the world, but was offered up to pay the price for your sins, that we can walk that highway of faith with Christ our Savior. That we can walk on that highway free from the fear of guilt, free from the fear of condemnation and God's judgment. Walk with Jesus to know we are forgiven and have life with God. Christ comes to make life great again and to guide you on that path to heaven in faith. There's a national group called American Atheists who at the beginning of this month started an ad campaign which has placed a few billboards in select cities around our country that play off of Trump's slogan from his campaign. These billboards say, Make Christmas great again. Skip church. Again, it's a simple message for us to understand. They say that to make Christmas really great, you don't need a relationship with God, you don't need church, you don't need Jesus. But the truth that we're reminded of today is that without Jesus, without Christ, Christmas really has no meaning. And even more than that, without Jesus, our life has no purpose and meaning. But God has come. And He has come to save us, to rescue us, to change our hearts and lives and to bring us to eternal life with Him. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. God fulfilled His promise and sent His Son Jesus to be your Savior. Christ comes to make life great again for you. And that's a campaign that we can all get behind. Be glad and rejoice that Christ has come. Amen.